Hello, hello, and welcome one and all to another edition of Heavy Hands. I am Connor Rebush, your host, feeling much better than I was last week. I want to thank everyone for bearing with me, my wheezing, my uh, worse than usual mouth sounds, I'm sure. I know there's a couple listeners in particular who really hate that aspect of the show. <laughs> and, uh, and certainly my coughing fits that caused at least one interruption. That mocking laughter that you hear in the background comes from my co-host, Phil McKenzie. Oh my god, he's trying to impress our other guest, which is why he's trying to seem cool in front of another Englishman, which is why he didn't say his new catchphrase. And that other Englishman is back so soon, Kyle McLaughlin. What's up, Kyle? Yo, I'm really, really saddened to hear that you survived your cough. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Um, we have a, we have a, a mixed bag episode for you to, uh, to help us through this week, don't we? Yeah, seems that way. Um, you know, uh, plenty to talk about. We're all friends, um, different <laughs> opinions will abound, I'm sure. But yeah, a variety of different topics and hopefully enough to keep your fantastic listenership engrossed wow. for the, uh, full duration of the episode. Playing to the crowd. He was just saying you were all disgusting hogs just before absolute, we started. Absolute bunch of cunts. But, you know, you've got to be nice to them, haven't you? <laughs> That's going to get us demonetized on YouTube. I don't think you can say cunt that soon into the uh, episode. You can if it's, like, not in, like, the first minute. So as long as you have a cold open from the right, plethora of, uh, of great topics we discussed beforehand, then, uh, we're safe. yeah, you should you should be okay. We're safe. We, we had I mean, you're really going to have to try and find... Uh, an isolated minute in which Kyle doesn't call something a cunt. Yeah. <laughs> God, now everyone's saying it. Oh, put, a this... time, put a little marker on the timestamp, Connor, and just put a beep in. No, that's, no, that's a lot of effort. Um, I've only barely survived this cough, so I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, okay. All right. So we've got UFC 282. I was, uh, I was saying and fully believing that it was much, much better before a slate of cancellations. Phil, ever the pessimist. Uh, has uh, pointed out, probably not incorrectly, that m maybe it hasn't actually lost that many fights. So maybe it was just um, pretending to be a card that wasn't depending on like one or two really interesting fights as much as it really was. Uh, of course, it was supposed to have Yuri Prashaska versus Glover Teixeira 2, um, a rematch of an absolute barn burner contested for the light heavyweight t uh, title earlier this year. And um, that fell through. Yuri Prakowska, who I uh, I pegged as a man who believes very earnestly in the concept of honor, did the honorable thing, got injured, and immediately abdicated the light heavyweight title. Like, didn't even wait. I don't think anyone asked him. There was no expectation that that was what he was supposed to do. He just did it. He sepukud himself within seconds uh, of getting an injury. And so now the belt is vacant and being fought for in the main event of 282 between my boy Jan Blakovic and uh, nobody's boy, Magomed Ankalaev. And, uh, you know, it's a fight. It's not as good. It's interesting. There's things to say about it. We're going to say them. After that, we had the rubber match between Roman Gonzalez and Juan Francisco Estrada last weekend. Quite possibly, I think, the best of their three fights with some of the most dramatic momentum shifts I've ever seen between these two men who have always delivered fascinating and thrilling rounds. Um, very excited to have Kyle on in particular to talk about that one. Uh, he and I have both talked about that series and both of those fighters several times in the past. And like I said, I think this may have been their finest hour yet. And uh, other than that, we've got – there's some other stuff from UFC 282. There were some interesting results and fun, silly fights last week. Uh, something will end up as a bonus episode on the Patreon. Whatever doesn't make it onto the main show. But without we're not further talking about, Sorry, we're not talking about any more of UFC 282. Just to, I know it's your show. It's just not happening, Connor. We're well, not talking about any more of that card. By the way, wasn't at one point John Jones versus Stipe Miocic very lightly rumoured for this card? Yeah. Probably would have made... Yeah. And obviously, I sound like an idiot saying that, but I'm pretty sure at some point that was also the plan. And you would have had, you know, three fights between all big fellas, but 
it would have been somewhat yeah. more of a pay-per-view card. Um, I, I got to say, I'm becoming dangerously overconfident now because I've been saying for years and, and just through stubbornness and keep, keep insisting that John Jones is never going to return. And I, I had a moment of doubt when they made that announcement. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, no, I just I'm gonna stick into my guns. And lo and behold, John Jones is like he looks fat and bloated. Uh, he got titties. Yeah, it's just never gonna happen. He is never coming back to MMA. I mean, um, the, these are no barrier. If were he going up to any other weight class, you would think being fat and bloated would be a barrier. To well, him. but we were just talking about <clears throat> Conor McGregor in similar tones before the show. He's never coming back to MMA either. And I think for very similar reasons. Both of these guys are bullies. They both like to be bigger than their opponents. I don't think either of them really likes the idea at all of actually coming back now that they've both gained weight and having to fight people who are now essentially the same size as them. Mm -hmm. Neither of them will do it. Um, So neither of them is coming back. That's my uh, theory. Conor McGregor has been added to the list. John Jones, 100% certain the man's never fighting again. Uh, he's certainly not fighting on this card. Instead, we've got Jan Blokovic and Magomed on Kalayev. Who wants to kick us off with this uh, with this um, <clears throat> perplexing fight? Uh, Take okay, it away. So, I mean, there's two there's two basic dynamics here, right? Which is that if you watched Teixeira against uh, if you watched Teixeira against uh, Blahovic, you would just be like, I am not picking Jan Blahovic. Or indeed, histor- historically, Jan Blahovic against any good wrestler. Right. Apart from, I guess, Corey Anderson in the remake, in the rematch. You'd just be like, I'm not picking him over wrestlers. It's been a glaring Achilles heel. And him for the for the basically his entire UFC career, mm-hmm. he gets put on his back. He's you know got this giant torso that he physically cannot get off the ground. Mm-hmm. So he always has to struggle to stand up with his comparatively tiny legs and arms, and then he's just exhausted and mentally demoralized. And there's you know no reason to assume that's not there anymore. Any functional wrestler should be able to just get in on him, take him down, and beat him up. Over five rounds, you've got to assume that's almost a certainty. Yeah. Functional with a capital F and three asterisks before the word mm-hmm. res- before the word wrestler there, because <laughs> I can feel the point you're leading to. Yeah, that's the second dynamic, which is the is Magomed Ankalaya of the new John Jones, and that's. You know, because again, you could you could have said the same thing about uh, Tiago Santos when he went in to fight John Jones. You're just like this guy's never beaten anyone with a wrestling and with good wrestling and top with a good wrestling and top game. Because... Forget, yeah, yeah. You could say the same thing about when he fought Ankalaev. Just happened, mm-hmm. and Ankalaev yeah. didn't take him down at all. Yep, he didn't even think about it. Mm-hmm. Despite yeah. getting knocked down at one point in the fight. He didn't even think about taking the fight to the ground. Very strange. So, yeah, what what's happened? Why why has he had the John Jones I've forgotten how to wrestle track before even winning the title? And I, I just don't know what the answer to that is. But yeah, Phil, Kyle, you go Phil, for it. I was about to say, before Rebus, because he was prattling about wasting our time, <laughs> we kind of touched on this beforehand, which is weird because... I thought the dynamic between us three was going to be a little bit fraught because I actually thought we might be coming at this from vastly different things because, um, well, not vastly different, but I certainly thought that I would probably be the pessimist of the group in regards to Uncle Liev. Um He is not a proactive wrestler, but then if you, the Glover, the Glover Yan fight, for example, very, Glover takes you as knows it's extremely slow, does not take much to run Yarn against the cage, level change wise. You throw some shots on top, faint a uh, level change, and he will scurry back. You push him back on the back foot, he's very easy to get down. And that's why Uncle Ive's not like a open space shot threat anyway. He's going to get you against the cage, you know, drag you down and work from there. And he's really, really good on top. But he's a low output counter striker who doesn't proactively grapple um, 
I see the John Jones comparison, but for, he's been like that for a while anyway. Yeah. I mean, in terms of like just not being proactive at all, doesn't seem to want to do it. And his sort of MO of excellent counter striking, in my opinion, love how quick he is on the trigger. love the variety of uh, looks he can respond to. Um, and I want to preface this actually by saying, I think Ankalaev will beat Jan Blahovic, um, which I'm sure we'll get into in a minute, but I find him, and I know this is going to cause some issues with certain listeners because I know he's got a fan base and I know people are desperate for some sort of prime and interesting light heavyweight to latch onto and the hope that we'll get some sort of Habib adjacent fighter at 205. But he just seems to be, and I think I've mentioned this before on the podcast, some people just inherently passive and some people just aren't able to do consistently what they should be able to do. And he just seems to be a guy who's really comfortable countering and not very proactive. And actually, he's not a proactive jabber. So when he's not really, all I'm trying to say is, Uncle Levy, when he's not doing what he needs to be doing, he isn't really doing much at all. Not a proactive jabber, not a proactive <clears throat> leg kicker. Love the sort of uh, open stance, rear side body kick, which he uses a lot, or the snap kick. Both really good tools. Jan Blachowicz is pretty good at defending those tools. That limits what Uncle Live can do in this fight even more so. Um, and yeah, what should be a relatively straightforward fight for Uncle Live, I, I, he isn't going to make it that. And we're going to have probably a pretty tepid kickboxing match. Is that fair to say? It seems very likely. And and I think, honestly, once you assent, once you consent to a tepid kickboxing match, I'm no longer confident at all that he's going to beat Jan Blachowicz. Because, like, this is the best range kickboxer he will have tried that against if that is the if he sticks to the route he's been doing lately. And again... He didn't try to take Tiago Santos down until the fourth round of a fight. And, and, and got clobbered with a left hook in an exchange, which, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this was a guy who, Tiago Santos, who allowed him to pressure, uh, gave him all the space and time in the world, offered very little for much of the fight. Um, and, um, yeah, he just couldn't really build any momentum and he certainly didn't try to surprise him with anything other than literally one strike at a time kickboxing jabs i mean i like his strike selection again there, there's i want to like Ankalaev's style more than i do i think i, I did we go over this connor did, yeah. isn't this the same conversation we had with prayer and understanding the other week you cannot give these a power puncher mm. extended time to hit you but Ankalaev does this with everyone. Yeah. He's too risk averse to the point where it comes back around and actually becomes risky. There's no reason to go into a fight. If this is what he does, there's no reason to go into a fight with a guy like Blakovich and say, you're going to get to use your jab. You're going to get to set up kicks. I'm going to throw only single strikes, which uh, presumably I'm doing because I don't want to get countered, but which people who are actually good at striking know is actually a great way to get countered <laughs> is to not throw any combinations to assure the opponent round after round that really, if you can time the one thing I do, I'm not going to do anything else after it. So try to hit me back. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's frankly an extremely dangerous, uh, approach. The, the better your opponent's get at striking. And, and we should point out as well that if we're using that Tiago Santos fight as a, as a barometer, that is not close to the best version of Tiago Santos. That is another man who has been sort of a shell of himself, uh, for the last like three years at least. Uh, and again, he still knocked Uncle Lev down at one point. I do think that Uncle Lev will win because. Yeah. As much as I love Jan, I think he's a quality fighter. He just sort of he does that thing too often where he sort of dips his head before he barrels into the left hook. For someone like Ankalai, who's really good uh, at responding to those sort of tails, I do think he'll clobber him with something. And I do think he'll have enough big moments to sort of win the fight pretty clearly, if not knock him out. Yeah, um, Ankalai has got a decent counter absolute, left, decent, yeah. decent counter uppercut too. I mean, yeah. The conversation is less about this matchup and more about 
Uncle Ive as as a whole because we're now on the precipice of him winning a title. Um, and I think he was always seen as like the coming man. And although I'm sure people would just accuse me of being a hater or a pessimist or maybe just not liking his style, um, all of which I think would be somewhat unfair as criticisms. And I'm happy to say uh, to see that we are actually aligning on some of these reads. Um, he's now come to the point where he's about to be the champion of 205. And as I said earlier, people have been desperate for something to latch on to for a while. I'm not so sure that he isn't just good for 205. I don't think he's oh, good. Yeah. I think he's just oh, yeah. good for 205. Like so many other yeah. 200, 205 pounders that we've seen in the wake of John Jones's prime. Or indeed, the, the, the prime of John Jones and Daniel Cormier. Phil, am I, I'm not being unfair, right? No, no. I mean, I think that's. I mean, that's that's his sort of blessing and his curse is that he's a he's a fairly well rounded, quite tough, you know, atypical fighter in a in a division of weirdos. Is that he's just good at stuff, um, but he's not fantastic at anything really. Yeah. Um, Crisp technique but, everywhere. I mean, again, good straight punches. He he hits the body. Good kicker. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he does. I think be. he does. I he think we are be. we are underplaying his jab a bit. I mean, as a southpaw, sure. he's quite an active jabber, really. Absolutely. Uh, again, particularly for this weight class. And so, yeah, I mean, I tend to side with Kyle in that. I think it's probably a fight where, I mean, and I think it, he doesn't throw a lot, but his positioning and cage craft is also like it's fine. Like he's mm-hmm. uh, he was able. To, he's. I mean, I think this is one of the things that made that. Uh, Santos fight so dreadful is that uh, is that Ankalaev is happy when he's backing someone up and Santos is be, is happy being backed up you know he's he's really become very Woodley-esque in the latter yeah. half of his career for sure where he'll just sort of hide on the fence and wait for a big counterpunch and they just sort of ended up staring at each other Conversely, I also think Blahovich does not have like the greatest cage craft or anything. And I think if you look at like say Rockhold as an allegory for like a kicky south big southpaw, um, Blahovich got backed up a lot in that fight. Sure. And uh, Rockhold was able to run him into the clinch, but also it was the fact that like Blahovich gets uncomfortable when backed up and then just charges off the fact the cage at people. And that's counter punches, or that's clinch opportunities, and I think possibly one of the reasons why, you know, why re- why wrestling success has compounded so disastrously against him in the past yeah. is that his his response is just to charge. Um, and yeah, none of that really. And, and it's just it's just the age thing. I, I got to quibble with that. Uh, Thirty two. Thirty, I think. I think he's just thirty. 30. Yeah. And Jan's like 39, 40 or Yeah, he's coming up for 40 years old. Like, it's just, it's another one of these things where I'm like, do I trust you to the last five rounds without, like, again, you know, we sort of talked about this in the Adesanya fight. Even if he's not enforcing his wrestling, like, it's probably going to happen at some, you know, there's too much of a chance of it happening by accident. I think there's a, there is, like, a really solid chance that Jan just, beats him up at range or at least just wins relatively convincingly at range and when they clinch up Jan just punches him on clinch breaks you know and he yeah. sort of reenacts the the rock cold fight i think it's a pretty st- strong possibility but i don't think it's the major possibility I, I'll, I'll quibble with one thing there um i i think i think we're now at risk of underselling jan blakovic like um it, it, is he does he get uncomfortable and then he blitzes forward? Yeah. Um, do I think Uncle Iev is going to like kill him with one shot each time he does that? Eh. But I think more more to the point is that like Jan is like always uncomfortable. <laughs> he's uh-huh. a very he's a very tense fighter. Yeah. I think like a lot yeah. of um, he's awkward. He's awkward. Yeah, yeah. Like and like a lot of uh, what passes in MMA for like your natural counter punchers, Jose Aldo. Um, Rafael Sunsao, like these guys are better than Blakovich, obviously, but they're also both very tense. Like they, they, they keep that hair <laughs> trigger cocked and loaded the entire time. Um, because you have to just be aware of a massive variety of shit that might be coming at you. Um, 
but he is a counterpuncher. And Ankalaev is so one and done. The fact that you can say it's bad sign for Jan that he was he was able to keep Thiago Santos backed up against the cage for the better part of five rounds. I think it could just as easily be a bad sign for Ankalaev that he was in that position. He was in pole position the entire fight and did fuck all with it. He didn't build to anything. Like, frankly, I think, I think the fact that he got, uh, Santos down with a body lock in round four was the result of the fact that that was the round where Santos decided to come after him for 30 seconds. Like, yeah. <laughs> Santos finally made something happen. He was like, Oh my God, I have to close this guy down. I have to finally clinch. He, he's, so, he's so passive sorry, in what just should quickly, be though. a very active position. Yes, Kyle? Just quickly, because you just, while you're on that point, I don't want to miss it. Try uh-huh. and talk over you. There is the chance, and I want to sort of comment on what Phil said about the jab as well. There is the chance that actually, if you give him more to work with, he will have more counting opportunities and therefore be less passive and fulfill sure. his potential, so to speak. There's a chance that he's fighting to the level of his opposition. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And all these points we're making are mute points. And that actually he will not do fuck all if you give him more opportunities. But regarding the point about the jab, and that's the second thing I want to mention here, my criticism of his jab is not that it isn't good, it's that it's not consistent enough. There's space to be filled when he does nothing. Yes. Where if he jabbed more, he would draw more leads and have more opportunities to counter. For a pure counter puncher who can't create his own counters, that is why he is an aggressively frustrating fighter to watch yes but, yeah i mean you know Jan might be as a counter puncher himself yeah sure but when he dips his head and barrels and blitzes forward that left hook might just bring uncle i out to just catch him with something absolutely you say connor one and done but he it's, he does it hard uncle i um sure yeah he's he's accurate certainly he's a sharp hitter yeah mm-hmm. um yeah absolutely um but you know, like I just think it I just think it would be an error to be like, oh, the the crazy blitzes. That is always a risky thing that Jan does. It is it always presents an opportunity. Um whether or not you can turn that those singular opportunities, I mean it happens like once a round. You know, it's just like a thing he'll try every time. And if you can't capitalize to the extent that you like win the fight, then the fact that Jan is just actually decent off the back foot, unlike Tiago Santos, like Tiago Santos is Tyron Woodley. That's a very strong comparison. Jan Blachowicz can like sidestep and jab, you know, he can actually like keep somebody turning and resetting while they're pressuring him. Not great cage craft. No, but uh, maneuvering around the opponent, he's got some skill in that regard. And, Actually finding counters, finding counters in combination is also something he can do. Backing people off and then following them with kicks, like setting up his kicks, is something he's quite good at. There's also the fact, which is often a factor in Blachowicz's uh, biggest wins, that he's a great kick defender and kick counterer. Yeah. And this is also <laughs> a huge part of Uncle Live's offense. He's, he's such a pot shotter. He just wants to pepper people. And... um Blakovich's defense, both the kicks and everything else. I mean, weird as his striking defense can be, you you have to build to take advantage of the fact that the guy like leans and picks his chin up in the air to get away from strikes. You got to put combinations together to exploit that. And if you don't, he's just going to make your shots miss and be looking to counter. I, I don't know, man. I think I, I think it, there's a very high chance that Ankalaev just kind of starts losing pretty quickly on the feet. And I think if Jan could take that body kick away, that again, as I said earlier, completely yeah. limits what Ankalaev can do. Yeah. Just don't know if I trust Yard at this stage. Yeah, that's fair. He's old, you know. Yeah, so I mean, you know, we've we've talked about sort of Islam as being the sort of generically well rounded skill guy of um uh, lightweight, you know, which is also a division of weirdos, albeit, you know, obviously a much better one than, than 205. But, like, you can see why, like, people who I think uh, who have, like, antipathy be- towards Islam, I think, are simply haters. 
Like, yeah. because he is someone who had a tremendous amount of potential and then has simply gotten better and better and has been beating yeah. better opposition more convincingly than he did like people in his earlier fights. He Spot is on. rising to the occasion yeah. and he looks like a pound for pound talent. He's a genuine is, phenom. That is like exactly yes. what you want to yeah. see out of somebody. Who else. is thrashing very good fighters. Yeah. Whereas Ankalaev is the exact opposite where he simply looks like a worse fighter than he used to. Yeah. Um, the best Ankalaev well, we've the seen in the UFC... The, the, the best talk alive we've seen in the UFC was for 14 and a half minutes against Paul Craig. <laughs> Literally since then. He's been like, is oh. that why he stopped? Is that why he stopped? Does I think it put him off grappling. I think it ha- it has to be considered as a, as a component that he, I that was a super. I that run. I need to rewatch it. I mean, granted it, it, it it's Paul Craig. So like you can just not even try to take the guy. Is down who? And you're... who is it? Paul who Craig. Paul, 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 Paul. Craig? Yeah. Paul... Yeah, it was. No, 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 it's not. It's Paul Craig. Cr- we don't say Paul Craig over here, oh Rebush. It's Craig. Okay? I, I think Craig I think you'll find exist. that your pronunciation is not exactly how Paul Craig himself says it. So fuck off. Because he's got a Scottish accent, it's Paul Craig. That's right. So Okay, we so we're all agreed. We have to pronounce it Paul Craig from now on. <laughs> okay. But he's not Welsh. Right. We, we've Craig. all We've all agreed. F- Phil's going to like that if I start doing my wonderful accents. I don't know what that was. <laughs> um, I think it was Australian. I, 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 I think that's I'll Connor's derailed Australian. Derailed apologies. Yes. <laughs> this never happens. <clears throat> I got to do a fun uh, uh, Australian written accent when I was talking about Bobby Knuckles being a uh, Jordan Peterson fan. Did you enjoy that, Phil? On Twitter. I believe I did, yes. Yeah. Look, would you look at the poor bloke? We gotta buy a ticket, babe. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that's actually not. Oh, actually, that's not your worst attempt, Colin. That's quite thank good. Thank you, thank you. It's actually very. Don't good. encourage him. Sorry. Hello. Oh, you're, you're, a, you're a big useless twat, and I hate you. <laughs> thank Sorry, you. Sir, was that better? Yeah, thank that's you. much better. Much Hello, better. Hello, that's very rude. Um, this is, you did this. Fucking now, okay. Yeah, I am genuinely sorry, Phil. I don't know what I've done. <laughs> so, so ankle eye of shit, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. He's, yeah, he's, for whatever the reason, he's too risk averse. I just don't, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to take a flyer and pick Jan just because. I'm, I'm still not sold on that card. That's fine. Sorry, That's but... fine. Um, I just don't know that, like, literally having been made to run into a clinch, which is not exactly where Jan Blachowicz tends to get taken down by people. They tend to be leg attacks. Um,. If if having to have a guy outstrike you to the extent that then you're like, I have to clinch him is really a super reliable path to victory against Blachowicz. And I, I really I've convinced myself that Blachowicz is um, going to slowly or maybe not even that slowly start building to a lead on the feet just because Uncle Live just is, is too passive. Yeah, I mean, I think I've got a, I've, I've, I'm still going to pick Ankalaev, but I mean, it would be, it would be completely baffling for someone to basically re-engineer John, the John Jones loss to Tiago Santos without ever, be, like, without even reaching the point at yeah. which you know he's defending a belt, and you would understand why he would have an insanely conservative style and so on, and, and you know he right. wants to preserve his knees and whatever, like. It would be so weird and somehow awesome if he comes out and just steadily loses like a tit for tat kickboxing match with Jan Blachowicz. And then, but again, he's like he's practically ten years younger than him. He's got so many skills available to him should he use them. He has a good double leg, or he did before, you know, at some point. He is, you know, he has a variety of takedowns from the clinch. He is a good counterpuncher. He can kick, he can jab. He can keep a pace. He's very tough, you know. Yeah. It's everything you want, but like, I think I'm still just gonna, uh, I've got to pick him just because so many fighters, you know, come out there for their, you know, have sort of coming out performances for their, um, for when they, they fight for the belt that I can't discount his ability to like actually access some of the skills that we know he has. But as of now, like he's, you know, you just got to look at him and think, what are you doing right now? And you're 
you're yeah. winning, but come on, buddy. You used to be you used to be better than this. Foot on the yeah, gas sure. a little bit. He could make this. He has all the requisite skills to make this a very easy win. He will not put them together. Therefore, it will be, if not tougher, then it can even be comprehensive and still be disappointing, if that makes sense. Um, I am picking on Kalaev, but if he loses a fight, which if he just had, I'm not sure if it's, no, no, I am sure it is a mental thing. If there's this mental block of what, you know, not being able to do, uh, and then funny enough, I'm sure we'll talk about it later in some regard about the Holland Wonderboy fight, you know, there's, there's a clear path to doing better than you should be doing. Yeah. And Ankaev doesn't seem to be able to do that. Um, in this fight, he really should be able to, because as I said, there's plenty of data, as we said earlier, on, on Jan Blahovic and how he is not very good in certain phases, especially if you get him down. He just sort of full guard and sits there. He doesn't try wall walk or anything. He's not very good at anything mm-hmm. like that. Um, He'll try goofy, light heavyweight style submissions, like arm yeah, triangles yeah, he's, off he's, his he'll back. He'll do 2005 yeah. and tie you up. <laughs> That's basically all we can do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, but it will be hilarious. I said that earlier, I don't like funny. I don't like funny results, but it would be hilarious to see a certain contingent of Twitter absolutely lose their shit if Uncle Iev loses. And also, I think it will be the final nail in the coffin for him because although you could say that Jan's a really good fighter and a really dangerous fighter, this is really set up for Ankle Live to win. And I think the UFC really wanted this champion to preserve their Abu Dhabi fight cards and all that sort of thing. So hmm. they they really want him to be champion, in my opinion. This is a somewhat, in my which opinion... Is, which is strange, from. just from a marketing perspective, I guess. It makes sense, but he's, he's quite boring. Usually that's quite not boring. the guy that they desperately want to be champion, right? Yeah, but at the same time, what are you going to do at 205? You know what I mean? Like, eventually you get a fight with, with, with Yuri Prohaska, which is, is going to be fun. Yeah. Um, so, Lyle yeah, I think, you know... Wins the belt. Going off on a tangent again. Sorry, Connor. No, you're fine. Um, but I just think... I think Uncle Ive will win, and I'm pretty confident he will. Um, but just if he does lose, there'll be a certain wave of people that will completely lose their shit. It's not the result that would find funny, but the reaction. So yeah. um, I'm rooting for something of interest to happen in this fight, but I think it'll be pretty much one-way traffic, even if it should be much easier, much more comprehensive, and much more of a definitive win for Uncle Ive. And hey, I'd love to be proven wrong, because I'd like to see a, a light FBI worth caring about as well. Mm-hmm. So Uncle Iev wins the belt, and then Yuri Prokoska returns from the wild. And gets <laughs> chinned by Uncle Iev in about 30 <laughs> seconds, running into something no. like a madman. He, he yeah. Yeah. returns, he's shriveled like a prune, because he spent the last seven months in like a mystical hot spring, healing himself. And... The way I see it, Connor, I tend to pick fights now based on, do I think that a result is going to happen that gives me a more... Uh, sort of, uh, sorry, a less annoying time on social media. And more often <laughs> than not, the answer is no. So Uncle Ive will win, and I'll be out of here for six months about how he's unbeatable. What did I see today? I can't believe he lost as an amateur because he looks unbeatable. And it's yeah, like, I saw that. Yeah, so, you, so you've been following MMA for about ten minutes? Yeah, what does that even mean? Like, yeah. He lost as a professional as well, and we've seen him lose rounds to... Krilov and, and Thiago Santos. He got submitted and, by Paul Craig. I mean, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. The, no one's unbeatable in MMA, but this kind of idea that, and I really am finally going to say what I want to say, but this kind of idea that fighters from a certain region are all Habib-esque and are all destined to be this unbeatable super champion it, it is erroneous. Yeah. And uh, I'm sorry to tell everyone, but I do think he'll win the championship this time, this Saturday. And I do think against this current crop of 205 pounders, he'll be quite difficult to beat due to what we've said. And he does have some positive attributes. So I really, I think he's, I really do think he's a fantastic counter striker, but ankle Ive, he's not it. Hmm. All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and end the first segment there. When we come back, Roman Gonzalez, Juan Francisco Estrada three, if you didn't watch it already, I recommend you literally pause this episode right now, if you're able, and go and watch it, because it was absolutely fantastic. Um, 
And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that. I'm very excited to after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like. And in return, you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now, let's get back to it. All right, welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are uh, talking about some boxing now. Roman Gonzalez, Juan Francisco Estrada 3. Um, I, I, I've already said multiple times, and I guess we may as well use this as a jumping off point. I think this was the best, or perhaps, and this is a thing of yours, Kyle. You always get annoyed because people insist on saying that something is the best, when they could simply say it's their favorite. So I'll say that. This was my favorite of the three fights between these two men who have always combined to deliver completely thrilling, wall-to-wall, action-packed fights. Um, this, to me, had the most dramatic momentum shift of any of their previous fights. I think it also, um, you know, as a fan of Juan Francisco Estrada's style, I think it was his best performance to date, uh, particularly against Roman, but because it is Roman, maybe against anyone, the best fight he's ever fought. I thought he looked incredibly sharp. He really seemed to have learned from his previous encounters with Gonzalez and, um, I thought that despite the massive swing in the middle of this fight where Gonzalez suddenly started winning, Estrada, even at that point, even flagging, even feeling the pressure, uh, perhaps feeling the effects of his own brilliant, super high-paced work in the early going, still continued to find brilliant moment-to-moment little tactical ideas. Uh, I thought this fight was awesome. Like, I was on the edge of my seat. I was yelling at the screen. I was, I was like hunched over, clasping my hands together. I was in all the poses of just extreme tension because I was so engaged with the, with the story that was playing out here. Um, this is another thing, by the way, just before we start, I thought, uh, you guys know, uh, Troy MMA Twitter's Troy PDL MMA. Mm-hmm. He had an, an interesting point, which I, which rang re- very true to me. Uh, cause this and the Holland Thompson card were happening on the same night at the same time. And he he said that um, this really shows like the difference between and while there will never be full crossover between boxing and MMA, because that MMA card was just like a festival of violence. It was just like stupid, horrific things happening constantly, just one after the other. And usually the first most stupidest and most horrific thing in each fight would be the thing that would end the fight and then you'd move on to the next one. Whereas this like all the best boxing matches was like an actual story. This fight was like a novel. There were chapters. There was so much sort of progression. There was an arc to how this fight played out. And you get that sometimes. I mean, we, I, I did, I compared Adesanya Pereira to like a, a five chapter story or something, but, um, Sometimes you just got to be reminded, I think, that like the, the best boxing can offer is a fight like this, where there is a real sort of story that you can follow that develops and changes this fascinating dynamic between these two fighters. So th- this one was really satisfying to me. It just it hit all the marks. <coughs> Kyle, you don't think it was the best of the three categorically? Uh, no, not categorically. No, not at all. Um could easily be seen as such. And I actually think the story that these men are telling, they've been telling it since 2012. Sure. I think the story of the the Juan Francisco Estrada Roman Gonzalez rivalry has been played out over three fights. And I think you see a full story if you watch them chronologically back to back. I think they tell, you can see the history of both of their careers. Mm -hmm. Both, in my opinion, 
first ballot Hall of Famers. I'm not really into the Hall of Fame, but you know, that's an easy, shorthand way of explaining both these guys. Um, I spoke on my own podcast this week on Combat Chronicles on the, the episode I released this week. It was called The Trilogy. And it was a kind of jokey uh, title in a way, because, of course, there was a another boxing match uh, this weekend, which uh, completed a trilogy. But it was a trilogy no one asked for. And that podcast I did this weekend, it only covers the Gonzalez Estrada trilogy, making only fleeting reference to the boxing match between a fighter that you, myself and Phil have discussed, I think more than once on this podcast, Tyson Fury, and his fight with Derek Chisora. A fight which was no one asked for and was completely uh, sort of disposable. This fight here between Estrada and Gonzalez was, it was inevitable. It was, it was, it was perfect. Everything boxing, everything that's great about boxing played out in this fight and it's played out in all three of their fights. Mm -hmm. What's great is the little extra wrinkle to this one. The story of all three of their fights is essentially the same. And it's that Estrada is too quick of uh, fleet of uh, foot and too, uh, has too much of a speed advantage in terms of his sort of combos and his counter punching in the early going. Gets off to a good start and Gonzalez chips away, works his way into the fight with his incredible pressure fighting style. Um, and by the middle rounds, he catches up to Estrada and by the end of the fight, he's piling it on. Estrada, for whatever reason, um, against Gonzalez, he either cannot keep it up and stay away. Or the fact of the matter is he's a fantastic inside fighter himself and he does feel more comfortable as the fight goes on. Most people get drowned by Gonzalez and Estrada is able to swim in those waters, yeah. at least keep his head afloat, although sometimes he's dragged under. But in this fight, what's amazing is um, if anyone's seen their second fight, which Connor, you and I actually recorded a commentary for, which technically it did not work out. Um, yeah. Maybe for the patrons, we should we should watch all three back to back and we should absolutely you know, commentate do that. them all. Yes, I think Phil would be would love to join in on that as well. Yeah, um, I'm down. Now, now, now that trilogy is over. Um, Although they're already where, talking about doing a fourth fight because they, I'm sure we'll talk about that as well. Do you know I mean where these guys go next? But what's great about this fight? A little extra wrinkle. Estrada finally has a strong twelfth round. Then Gonzalez had his moments in the twelfth round, but for Estrada to finish strong, and I know the narrative coming out of this fight, all you boxing fans out there, and for those that aren't aware. There's a lot of boxing fans that feel hard done by that Gonzalez didn't get more out of these two fights. Certainly in their second fight, there was an argument that he was hard done by. Mm -hmm. But for Estrada to win this fight and to finish strong, uh, looks it just looks great on uh, to watch that play out and to see Estrada deservedly have his hand raised and not... It's always weird when someone has their hand raised, they've just had a battering. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, well, you know, we, we score a fight round by round, but it, it never looks good in terms of the optics. Right. But this fight, Estrada came through some really powerful uppercuts from Gonzalez, fought his way back in and had a little second wind in that 12th round where he struggled with that in the other two fights. And yes, those middle rounds were breathtaking to see him try and keep his head above water as Gonzalez came on. Um, and we're talking a lot about Estrada now, but I'm sure in a moment we're going to talk about Gonzalez as well, because this is not the the Estrada story. This story is not about Estrada made adjustments against Gonzalez over three fights and eventually came out victorious. This is a fight and a trilogy that what it tells us a story of is that actually the scorecards don't really matter. But what it proves once and for all is that these two are unequivocally all-time greats, modern greats, and in my opinion, two of the top 100 fighters that we've ever seen in boxing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean was... it's just it, it really is like you, you know you, you we get now that we get the more complete picture. I mean, you know, one of the things is you know I've I've we talked about a bit before is you know the massive var variance of of combat sports and and MMA specifically, right? Is that you don't get to see people go up against each other that often, and uh you don't. Uh, and therefore, you know, you don't you don't get the natural sort of occurrence that you get in like other sports, like let's say I don't like like let's say tennis, where people get to play each other tons of times, and each match is really long, and you realize that you know sometimes one guy just has his day, and the other one doesn't. You know, sometimes Andy Murray is going to beat Federer, or you know, 
uh, Djokovic will beat Nadal or vice versa, right? You realize that how much it can come down to just a single day. And I think that that does sort of jive with what we've seen from these fights because each one of them has just been balanced on a razor's edge, you know? I think in the end, you might say, I think Gonzalez edges two of them and Estrada, I think, you know, most people would say Estrada probably, this is certainly Estrada's clearest win. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I mean, they're just remarkably well-matched fighters. But, I mean, for me, I I do think this one, for me, I I don't know, like uh, someone who who knows uh, Chocolatito's game better than I do could probably talk more about it. But I did feel like this was, the story of this one was was Estrada because I think one of the one of the um I think one of the interesting things about this one is that it felt a little more like a veterans fight in terms of its pacing in that it really built through into the middle rounds mm-hmm. and then sort of you know has that that big uh like the uh, sort of a showdown in the 12th it's really it's really building through. And I think a lot of that comes down to Estrada being able to fight this incredibly, incredibly disciplined and presumably, I mean, unbelievably mentally draining performance. Because one of the things I, I mean, I, I just keyed in on was like, you know, in terms of, in terms of punch selection and so on, I think he did, um, he did a better job of like using uppercuts and so on to yes. stand Chocolatito up when uh, Gonzalez was was chasing and pushing him into his chest. But more than that, and I think what really shocked me was his ability to punch and move and punch and move. Mm-hmm. Because in the previous fights, he eventually ends up... I mean, that happens in this fight as well. But you can see the difference in the first two fights in that he ends up just thinking, right, I'm going to stand my ground and beat this guy because that because I can do that. I can beat people in the pocket and I can I can out I can just I I can beat people in the pocket. I've got tremendous hand speed and I can punch in combination. I've got really good defense. I'm just I'm a I'm a really good boxer. Um and all of the fights have been Chocolatito convincing him that he has to do that because I mean A because it's it, it's just mentally <clears throat> exhausting. He just to, won't go away. Yeah, and it's just mentally exhausting to punch and then move your feet. And then, you know, you just have to do lots of things. Uh, and um, it's it's like a, a, there's a, a coordination to it, I think, of having to think about moving your feet and your positioning and your whilst you're keeping your defense going. It's exhausting. And the thing is that one, in this fight, he extends the time that he's able to stick and move against... Uh, Gonzalez far longer than he was able to in there. I mean, because uh, that's how the second fight starts. He's sticking and moving, but then he's he's he gets broken down into just you know banging with Gonzalez relatively quickly. Mm-hmm. This one he managed to extend it for multiple rounds, and then was able to keep bringing it back later on in the yes. fight. Yeah, like just long protracted, uh, long protracted se- sections sessions of just like. Of sticking and moving and not unlike fighting both himself and uh, Gonzalez at the same time, um, and so whilst you know Gonzalez was able to break him down, you know those with the the footwork and the um, and his his own strike selection and his pressure and so on, uh, he wasn't able to do it as consistently as as he has done before. And yeah, I mean, again, it was just like a. I, I just found myself thinking this guy has a mind like steel to be able to do that for that long. Yeah. I almost felt like <clears throat> it was, it, it, it almost, because of that, um, like I fully agree. I think funnily enough, last week I was like, you know, I, this series has actually convinced me. I think Roman Gonzalez is just better. Yeah. Yeah. And then look well, at I mean, this. That, I basically agree. Or <laughs> and, at least that he has Estrada's number. Right. In some if, very small way. That Yeah, and, and there's this sort of, I, I guess, fantastical idea that, like, oh, man, if we still had 15 rounders, like, Gonzalez would have would, would decisively be winning this whole series. Um, mm-hmm. And I think you look at the first two fights, and you do kind of have to come to that conclusion. That, like, oh, man, one more round, two more rounds, because Gonzalez has had such strong finishes, and there has been just that gradual process of him 
uh, yeah, wearing Estrada out mentally, wearing him out physically, and either convincing or forcing him to just have a, a Chocolatito fight. Um, but man, was this a great night for Estrada. Um, and I, I, I'm, I fully co-sign everything you just said, Phil. I thought the length of the sort of tactical sequences he was able to put together time after time, you know, jabbing his way in, getting shoulder to shoulder, hitting a quick little turn, you know, sometimes a little throw by, then an uppercut, resetting again, exiting with the jab. So Gonzalez has to go through the entire process of cornering him all over again. Um, all of these little bridge building sequences where he's just putting, you know, two offensive ideas, one defensive move, counters, changes angle, another combination uh, offensively. Um, it, it, it almost, I, I started to think about around round seven that, that finding so much success early more than he has previously with that kind of endless linking of ideas was going to be his undoing because yeah. I thought he had worn himself out. He had essentially like unwittingly helped Gonzalez find that midpoint turn that he's, he's always found. And um, no, it turns out he was still Estrada. Like e even though the rounds got worse for him after a certain point, he's still, he's always been capable of dealing with Gonzalez, of surviving and competing with him in Gonzalez's kind of fight. And then he kept going back. Uh, and I think maybe we saw a bit of Gonzalez's age here as well. I, I didn't feel that he could necessarily keep up his own winning pace. Um, yeah. And, and so there were times later in this fight where Estrada was actually able to like push Gonzalez backwards, where he had to take a little time off and get a breather. And uh, Estrada was able to reassert himself and get back to um, – it was just – it was the most proactive back foot performance I've seen from Estrada uh, consistently in all these fights. That he was consistently seeming like the man who was in control despite the fact that it was uh, after about round three almost always Gonzalez coming forward uh, the vast majority of the time anyway. And yeah, Strada was, I, I can't even explain it. It was magical. He was the, the mental and physical endurance it took to maintain that level of performance against a fighter like Chocolatito um, with the added factor that, yeah, I think it sort of enhanced the momentum shift that once Chocolatito did start to succeed, I was starting to think he might actually be able to finish Estrada this time. He's got him in dire straits up against the ropes. He's putting together five punch combos. The body shots Gonzalez landed in this fight were withering. And uh, yeah, Estrada just, it's almost as if he himself came in planning to have some rough rounds so that he could then basically go back to like round three in the final round and, uh, and turn in that exact same kind of performance again at the very end of the fight. It's incredible. If, if I may as well, like, I'm really glad that we've sort of waxed lyrical about Estrada because I said before we started the segment that the narrative is so much about how hard done by Gonzalez is that um, I think people are starting to sort of lose track of the fact that Estrada's brilliant in his own right. But as much as we just spoke about the virtues of, of Juan Francisco Estrada as a fighter, there's probably a point or two in this fight at most. And Gonzalez had so many amazing moments. And actually, yes, it is still the Roman Gonzalez show because Estrada had his moments. He had a lot of moments and he managed to find a second wind. Gonzalez had some incredible sequences in the fight. You said about those combinations. I think Estrada's a great all-rounder all and all-rounder is often used as a kind of jack-of-all-trades master of none. That's not always fair. All-rounders are, are a very much a thing in boxing um i think of someone like mike mccullum or someone like that mm -hmm. a great all-rounder and estrada is a great all-rounder he is not someone who sort of divers through certain sequences he is good everywhere roman gonzalez is a specialist he's one of the best pressure fighters of all time he is legitimately one of the greatest combination punches of all time yeah um and he had 
you know, you could easily score this fight to him. As much as we've said our great Estrada is, you could score this fight to him. You could score the second <clears> fight <throat> to him. And you could just about score the first fight to Estrada. I really want to stress that, although it's great to value both, uh, to value what Estrada did, these guys are so well matched. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What these fights demonstrate is that they're two brilliant fighters. I add Trisket saw Rungvisai in as essentially it's like a fabulous free type of thing. Um, because, That's what Phil was saying yeah. last week. He was yeah, supposed to I annoy you this week by comparing them to yeah, Foreman, Frazier, and Ali. <laughs> oh, I heard that. I heard that. Actually, Phil, <laughs> not, a, not a terrible comparison. Damn it. Damn it. Hooray. I heard it, and I heard Reaper say, oh, yeah, Kyle would hate that. But I kind of get it, because you've got the Foreman, Batter, and Frazier dynamic, but Frazier mm-hmm. being better matched up and with, with Ali dynamic, but Ali being better matched up with Sarung Masai, although, obviously, you know, Sorongo side did beat Estrada in the first fight. It took some awful game planning in the rematch for Estrada to beat him. What yeah. I'm trying to get the point I'm trying to get across is that Gonzalez really, apart from that second Sorongo side fight, you could make a case that he's well, he's certainly never been beaten convincingly. He has arguably never been beaten. That's even though I give Estrada this fight, and I think actually Connor, you and I, we scored the second fight to Estrada. But actually, when I rewatched it, I thought, you know, it could have been yeah. either way. The one thing that was egregious about this fight and would, often is a shame is that 116-112 card to Estrada. That's not something I could really agree with. Yeah. Um, did not see an 8-4 in there. But yeah, I thought Estrada seven least... rounds. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that's fair. A draw yeah. a draw's fair. A, a For draw sure. would have been perfect. Mm-hmm. It's almost a but shame really... you have to score these fights. <laughs> it really yes. is. Like... You don't have to. That's my point. You, you don't sure. have to. Watch them. See how well much these guy, guys are. Watch the story of each individual fight play out. And then see how similar, how many similarities there are. Um has Estrada started to pull away ever so slightly because Gonzalez at 35 is essentially 45 for a 115 pounder. Right. You know, he's had nearly 60 fights. Um, you know, it's, he is old for a small guy. Um, there is a chance, you know, the, the wheels could come off at any moment. But what I want to finish this on is the whole story of Roman Gonzalez and how I'm pretty good, Connor, I would say, at, Judging a fighter's current sort of form, especially in boxing, I'm pretty good at seeing, you know, right, okay, this is the career arc of a fighter and comparing that historically to what we have. And what I saw in the um, Roman Gonzalez Carlos Quadras fight was a fighter near in the end. What I saw in the first Sorungvisai fight was a fighter who had just given his last stand. Right. And what I saw in the second Sorungvisai fight uh, was a fighter who was finally past it it was over from gonzalez and the fact he has you know sorry to use a a sort of a trite term but like a phoenix from the ashes come back and had this second prime so to speak means that regardless of the results against estrada the scoring doesn't matter what we've seen in terms of the optics and the aesthetics of what gonzalez does and how he's been able to compete with a pound for pound entrant in estrada on a technical level consistently uh, tit for tat has been nothing short of remarkable. And those losses on paper being nowhere near as much as what the fights themselves actually do for his legacy. And Gonzalez comes out of these two losses, in my opinion, as an absolute winner. I understand the sort of uh, uh, the contempt of which certain boxing fans take these actual results with because they're desperate to see Gonzalez finally reach the top again. That would be the cherry on top, obviously, that he could get back, not just win a WBA regular, but to be the man again and to beat his great rival again. And in a way, therefore, beat the man who beat the man and sort of, you know, because obviously Estrada got that win over Strisket, sort of rung beside. That would almost be like, you know, just all those demons are raised. But I'm here to tell everyone, the boxing fans, the fights themselves, the ebb and flow of these fights... That's more than enough. Take solace in the fact that Roman Gonzalez competed on an equal level uh, with Juan Francisco Estrada and vice versa as well. I think we should just be privileged that we got to see these guys fight. And Phil, your point earlier about tennis was a great one. We only really see that in combat sports in stadium Muay Thai. We have these seven yeah, yeah, fight yeah. series 
and you get to see just so evenly matched. And the reason they keep fighting is because they're so evenly matched, the gamblers love it. Do you know what I mean? That's the only time we get to see that um, in combat sports. So be happy. Uh, when was the last time we had a series like this in boxing? Pacquiao Marquez, really? Um, yeah. You know, I'm struggling to think of anything else. So maybe, uh, unfortunately, the third fight was poor, but Canelo and, and Golovkin, you know, the first two fights, we, were so, we never thought we were going to get the first one. We were so happy to get them. And, yeah, two-way technical is the way I describe these fights. That's the phrase I tend to use. Action-packed, yes, but just the sheer technique on, on display from these guys. Just If anyone's listened to this and going, I don't really know much about boxing or the lower weights of boxing don't really seem that tantalising, take it from all three of us. Watch all three of these fights. McCallum Tony is another series I always... Uh... Three fights as well. The third one was a bit of disappointment. Yes, McCallum Tony uh, and McCallum Columbi as well. The second yeah, fight yeah. between uh, Mike McCallum and Sambu Columbi would be one of my all time great two way technicals. Ezra Charles, Harold Johnson. You know, there's mm. uh, Wilfredo Gomez and Salvador Sanchez. There are examples, and Canelo versus Golovkin, those two fights. That's, that's the pantheon we're talking about here, and Gonzalez and Estrada are absolutely in that pantheon. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, and I think. Yeah, going back to Carl's first point, you know, the the three fights. I mean, they've they've all got these things to, um, they've all got things to recommend them. You know, the first one, the first one is really, I mean, it's you get to see them basically in their physical prime. I mean, this fight is glorious and fantastic. But if you watch that fight and this one side by side, there is like a there is a noticeable like speed and fluidity difference um the second fight is the you know and all of them are all of them are sensational in terms of the action and the tactics the second one is the sort of phoenix fight for roman gonzalez you know it's him him coming back and proving everyone that he could to everyone that he could still do it and the third fight the third fight is like estrada i think with that incredible sort of games that incredible uh like mental performance and and the the like yeah the narrative arc of the fight itself um and yeah so i think they've, they've all got something they've all got their sort of unique strengths and um you know i think a lot of people liked the second one before this one happened but even then i said you know the first one i mean just just look at them in that fight. It is it is I, just spectacular. I think the first one's my favourite, Phil, because also it caught me by surprise. Mm. Um, I'd heard very little about Estrada. Mm-hmm. Looking back on it now and revisiting his early fights, it was clear he was the goods. But what was great is I saw a fighter emerge in that fight and went, right, he's actually good. He's yeah. actually good. Yeah. I know that Gonzalez is thinking I'm moving up to fly away, and I know he's had he had a particularly torrid fight with Chango Vargas totally different style to Estrada I saw Estrada and went ah right he's clearly got it and in his very next fight he went up and won the flyweight title and has been entrenched in the pound for pound list ever since it was like seeing um, uh, Azuma Nelson against Salvador Sanchez one of my favorite yeah, you know like Connor, that's breakout a fantastic comparison that's a great comparison one of my favorite breakout because... fights where the commentators don't even know how to pronounce the guy's name like no one knows who this dude <laughs> is and like, what the hell? How is he doing this to Salvador Sanchez, of all people? That's a great comparison, because obviously afterwards he proved he wasn't a flash in the pan. He got stronger, he yeah. filled out, and he became a great champion in his own right. And they were going to have that rematch, of course, for Salvador Sanchez's untimely death. And yeah. Nelson went to his grave and all those things. You know, <clears throat> these guys, we got to see the rematch and we got to see the third fight. So, again, I don't want anyone to be too disheartened. I do love the first fight because, as I say, Estrada in his very next fight went, oh, OK, yeah. What we just saw was an accidental matchup between two all-time greats that we didn't yeah. know we were getting, and that, um, that's that's the other thing that we don't get often in in combat sports is great fight like genuinely great world-class fighters fighting in their absolute physical prime. True, especially in like, boxing. Especially in boxing, yeah. it is a it's a gift. But I did like that about this one that it's lots to recommend. I did like that about this one, especially that it was not Gonzalez in his physical prime. I felt he looked slower and older. Still got it, though. Still and it, got it. Yeah, it lent this sort of extra uh, uh, note of, like, tragic heroism to it, which is always something that gets me in these fights. Like, uh-huh. um, And the fact that, like, yeah, no, no matter 
what a incredible last stand this might have been for Gonzalez that Estrada is just like pitilessly perfect throughout the fight. It's like no. You know, the most disgusting thing is Connor. Mm. There are so many avenues for them to make the full fight even more meaningful, even more tantalizing. Yeah. There's a couple other titleists out there in Franco and Ioka that are both interesting for different reasons, both beatable in my opinion for both of these guys. We could see a full fight unification fight we could literally see these guys go at it again with even more on the line gonzalez yeah. has still got enough in the tank um he'd go back to japan where he was you know he started off his career um where he was in the taken gym and he could fight yoka um, or he could fight franco who's uh bam rodriguez his brother because bam's now gone back down to flyweight so they haven't got to worry about having him to contend with and we could see these guys meet up with even more on the line and that is a really scary thought and i'm sure us three will be wanting to talk about it again. And do you know what? It's not like the Marquez Vasquez trilogy where a full fight would sour it. Or like I said earlier with the Golovkin Canelo, where no one wanted to see that third fight. Um, it's a bit of a Pacquiao Marquez full fight that, you yeah. know, where these guys keep confounding expectations and, you know, could absolutely keep turning up. I'm not going to count Roman Gonzalez out when I saw his career arc appear in front of me very, very clearly. And he's that fucking great that he proved me completely fucking wrong. So I'm yeah. not gonna, I'm not gonna count him out again. Estrada could lose a step, and suddenly they'd be really even, you know, just as well matched. We we think, you know, as the fights go on, that Estrada will pull away. He's getting old as well for 115 pounder. Mm-hmm. He's only got to lose. He's only got to slow down one round earlier, and suddenly, you know, it's 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 that kind of fight again. So. They're so well matched. Give me a full fight. Just give me a little bit of separation. A bit like Figueredo Moreno, you know. That's another one. Well, and like uh, uh, these guys, they haven't even knocked each other down in their fights. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. one little thing could go wrong and you'd have a completely yeah. different scorecard, a different story to, to the fight. Um, and it's not like you, you look at this and there aren't that. moments where somebody could have gotten chinned. Like, I can't believe that stat. You're right. I didn't even think about yeah. it. Never even, never even dropped each other. They have yeah. 36 rounds of war and no one's even been dropped. Pretty sure Gonzalez has only ever been dropped by Sorung Vasai. Yeah. Who's like the most overwhelming physical force that 115 pounds has ever seen. Estrada's been flash knocked down a couple times, hasn't he? Uh, Might have been, yeah, flash knocked down once or twice. And I said this thing about Estrada on my podcast, funny enough, which is the thing is with Estrada, you think that it's a bit different to Gonzalez. Gonzalez has these bad results and you go, oh, yeah, he's clearly a fighter who's aging out. But Estrada, he fights elite fighters, looks elite, and then in between he fights someone you've really never heard of, and I've yeah. heard of pretty much every super flyweight there is. And you go, where have they plucked this guy from? Suddenly Estrada looks bad, and you go, oh, he's aging out as well. But no, he does. He just prats about against guys he doesn't <laughs> think on his he level. He just doesn't care he's as well. He's yeah. bad, deceptively yeah. bad, and starts like admiring his own work, just spamming techniques and hoping to get rid of a guy. But he's not a massive puncher, Estrada. So he's like, I'm just going to spam left hooks against this guy. And you go, oh, fuck, Estrada's finally starting to slip. Maybe and that was... Uh... Gonzalez, and you go, oh, no, he's still one of the best pound-for-pound pound fighters in the world. Maybe that was Sorung Vasai's game plan in their rematch. He's like, I'm going to fight <laughs> terribly, and Estrada won't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't know what to do. And then well, sort of, as soon as Sorung was like, figured out what to do, you had a really close and competitive fight. True. Um, there's a guy who aged out. Real, real shame. But as I say, we've got three fights between Gonzalez and Estrada, two between Estrada and Sorong Vasai, and two between Gonzalez and Sorong Vasai. In my opinion, we talk about great fights. Uh, the best fight of the last decade was Pacquiao Marquez for Very close second place was Sorong Vasai versus Gonzalez 1. I think it's. I think if anyone wants to watch all... What have we got? One, two, three, four. I can never count. One, two, three, four. Five, seven bouts between them. Um, but we've got one between Sorong Vasai and Quadras, two between Estrada and Quadras, and one between Gonzalez and Quadras. Everyone should just watch all of those fights yeah. and just have this amazing world of elite level boxing exposed to you and go, fuck me, I'm sold. You know what I mean, like, if, if you know these guys already, you, you, you'll be able to sort of uh, be happy about you know, all these great memories we're sharing and, and how excited we are. But if you've never heard of these guys before, it's like when someone says, have you ever heard of this band? Oh, they're really good. Have they done anything else? Yeah, they've got about 12 great albums. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I've never been more excited than I am right now to <laughs> delve into this back catalogue. That's what this is. You've got these 
he's incredible artist. Quite just less so, but he's he's an important cog uh, in this story. Um, a bit important, important character, um, a, a secondary antagonist, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, important uh, to tell in these stories. But if you just want to watch fights between Estrada Gonzalez and Trisket sort of rung the side, you won't really find a, a better time in combat sports. Mm-hmm. All right. Oh, I love talking about boxing when it's good, Connor. Yeah, me too, right? <laughs> I, love, <laughs> I love talking about boxing when the fight's good and you don't even bother to argue about the scorecards, which yeah, so often yeah, sours these amazing fights. Um, yeah, honestly, who cares? I mean, let's do it again. Why not? Uh, let's take a break as well. When we come back, uh, Wonder Boy Holland, I think, and then we're out after this. I'll go have a wee. <laughs> Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support Heavy Hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are, but no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Oh, welcome back to Heavy Hands. Thompson. me. Sorry, Connor. I've just seen a picture of Dustin Poirier's foot. Oh, my God. Oh, don't describe it to me. Does it look like uh, does it look like Jair Bolsonaro's leg? Have you seen Looks that? Looks like fucking John Merrick's head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome back to Heavy Hands. We're not talking about Dustin Poirier's foot, however much it may be rotting off his body. Uh, also, best wishes to Dustin Poirier. Everyone likes Dustin, and he's apparently in serious condition with a staph infection at the hospital. So hope everything works out there. Um, but we're going to talk about Wonder Boy and uh, Kevin Holland. And, uh, you know, I last week was a character development episode for us, Phil. Mm-hmm. I, I have to say I'm I don't know if I've warmed to him, but I've I've accepted Roman Delidze. He's just like a big, goofy ogre to me now, um, who in the grappling phase, at least does some genuinely very cool things because that calf slicer pin finish on her Manson. That was pretty cool. lit. Has anyone called it the uh, Georgian leg shackles or anything? Yeah, <laughs> something. It's we got to come up yeah. with a cool name for it. It was a very very cool sequence of moves. Uh, so I got to give I the man who it was against. It was it was you know it, you know out grappling like that and then finishing him. You know I'm not a yeah. massive Manson fan, but to win in that phase against that fighter, very 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 sexy stuff. Respect. Um, and Kevin Holland last week, I was like, do I hate Kevin now? This stupid puncher style, so terrible. I realized before the fight started, I could never hate Kevin Holland. I was angry at him. But he was, like, coming out, dancing. His hair looked really stupid. He was, like, undressing on his way to the cage, which no one ever does. No one, like, gets ready for the check-in station during the walkout while singing and dancing. I was like, this is just a lovable man. <coughs> However, the style which led me to that brief resentment uh, absolutely bit him in his skinny ass tonight. Because... Boy, am I glad I didn't give up hope on Stephen Thompson simply because he's 70 years old. The rule still applies. If you're going to run in swinging idiotic punches at Stephen Thompson, he's actually just going to completely carve you up on the feet. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, there were some scary moments uh, for uh, Wonder Boy, as we guessed. But, uh, yeah, you, you like you need to actually be able to strike. You need to actually be pretty good at striking. And uh, Kevin Holland was not good at striking on this night. He got owned. Kyle, what did you think? Well, well, actually, very early on, he he was a bit better at striking because when he was actually like you know setting up his right hand behind the jab, he was clipping Wonder Boy. As soon as he was just swinging for the fences, yeah, he was getting Wonder Boy just classic step back. Even those back early hand, ones, step back here with the back end. Yeah, he, even those early ones. Yeah, yeah, he was setting it up better. But once he committed to the right hand, it's like, what are you doing, Kevin? You know how to box. Here's the thing. They flashed up all the scorecards, all the Twitter scorecards, and it was like <clears throat> blatant. You know, Kevin Holland, great distance management. It's like he's getting twatted every other punch. Yeah. Even in the first round, which you know, given the impact to those that that right hand, which had Wonder Boy 
rocked and the fact it was a competitive round yeah sure it's fine to score him for, score it for him yeah but don't act like he wasn't already getting tanked yeah um and as it went on he did not only did he not try and grapple much he, he... actively <laughs> gave up yeah half guard to just stand back up again which again is the kind of stuff that makes me love kevin holland forever because like yeah, it was a yeah, terrible, terrible he's, strategic decision. He's, decision he's, like, he's like he's like Jerry. Yes. He's like Jerry. Yeah. In that he is living his gimmick. It's not a gimmick. Yeah. Like he is actually that guy. He is but actually a giant to turn moron. Things on a dime and just fucking destroy someone like that in a way that you know he was getting. This basically became a showcase for Wonder Boy, and I loved it. He's it he's he's anti gamesmanship, Kevin Holland. Like that was such a win. The the silly takedowns that Stephen Thompson was giving up also made me feel good about my analysis last week because I was like, uh, I think really the main thing that's deteriorated for this guy is just his ability to anticipate takedowns and to wrestle against them. Uh That you stick him in his comfort zone, the thing he's been doing forever, and there's just so much muscle memory and built in timing and ability to read tells from the opponents that like he's still an exceptionally sharp, accurate uh, counter puncher. But yeah, like the they weren't even like real takedowns he gave up. I think there were two and they were just they just kind of collided and he fell over. They were really like comically bad sequences and i almost wonder if that's why kevin holland didn't take it he's like oh i didn't even mean to do that <laughs> yeah maybe stand back up that wasn't uh, the hey, thing i was going for i'm very happy with how it played out in the sense of there's not really much to talk about from a, a technical perspective because sort of we we haven't learned anything about either guy like you know was who they thought who we thought they were yeah but i loved watching it play out i oh, loved yeah. the fight um it was wonderful to watch wonder boy have a showcase and actually you guys might disagree but i loved the stoppage oh absolutely Um, yeah i loved it i loved it in the sense of i know people would have said oh you could have stopped it earlier but actually holland's really durable he was firing back he'd had moments where he'd rocked wonder boy early so i could see why they give him enough time to turn it around as soon as he wasn't responding well and actually not just getting clipped but getting dropped they went okay that's enough yeah that's enough because Whilst you're no selling, and he wasn't getting like back, he got, he got pushed back a couple of times, and Wonder Boy would kind of blitz him like he does. Mm-hmm. Um, but he wasn't like badly hurt or anything. He was he was standing up well to him. As soon as it was like, oh yeah, okay, you're not standing up well anymore, they just stopped it in between rounds, and they gave him enough time, not too much time. And um, yeah, I thought Holland played his part in a really fun fight, mainly a showcase. As I say, not a huge amount to talk about. But one thing I will say, we have the same conversation every time Wonder Boy fights, which is a lot of people getting very annoyed that people think he's a great kickboxer. Can we just say, with all of his faults, and God knows he has them, just to really this is, enjoy him as this weird he's fighter awesome. who's come from a weird background. He's got a really unique style. And let's embrace that rather than moaning about he's not a great kickboxer. He wasn't a great. No, no, no. He's an interesting mixed martial artist, yes. a unique mixed martial artist. And fuck me, was it fun watching him go to town on yeah. Kevin Holland? That's been my <laughs> that's been my stance for ages. Like, just watch the guy's MMA fights. He's awesome. How can you not enjoy this? Who gives a shit how fake point karate kickboxing is? And you know, like, who cares? It doesn't matter. It's the reason Stephen Thompson is at this point, the reason he's been very near the top of this division um, for so many years has nothing to do with his kickboxing record. It has to do with the fact that his style is uniquely well suited for MMA striking. Um, yeah. And the vast majority of opponents just, they get flummoxed by it. They don't know how to deal with it. And... Yeah, I mean, I've said before, but like he's someone where like there's a there is a sort of recipe of a fighter, a striker you could build to beat Stephen Thompson. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it's ever one that's ever actually really existed at welterweight. He's got the yeah, he's got the um, you know the a less pronounced version of the Khabib dynamic where you have to just sort of import people from other divisions. And be like, well, Max Holloway was at welterweight. He wasn't though. Like, yeah. there's no Max Holloway. Like, you know, or you have to like buff up the 
physical stats of people already who are already in the division. You're like, you know, maybe if RDA was bigger, then he would also be able to screw Stephen Thompson up. But he's one of these guys where, uh, yeah, he's, he's been caught and he's been, um, he's been caught and he's had, you know, he's lost contentious staring matches, which no one really won. And which he honestly, in retrospect, might have won all three of. But um, to the extent that anyone won any of them, yes. Yeah, but whatever. No one really. Good. No, I don't really care. Who cares? In in the complete opposite of the cho- of the chocolatito Estrada thing, I don't <laughs> yes. care about. And he has fights for a, a, the opposite reason. Um, but yeah, he's just like a, he's been a remarkably consistent good fighter, and. Uh, I, I would give it, you know, if you put him up against the best welterweights of all time, I think he would have a shockingly good, like, a shockingly good matchup spread against them. 100%. Um, uh, so about the, about this fight, um, I mean, I thought, like, uh, Kevin Holland was doing the stupid, like, he was being his most stupid self with yes. the most jumping and the most huge punches and the least jabs that we've ever, perhaps, ever seen. This was perhaps his dumbest striking performance. Yep. But it was also like sh- uh, what was sort of horrifying me at the beginning was the thought that it might actually work. Yeah. Because uh, Thompson was getting clipped. I mean, we said this before, like uh, Thompson's defense is his foot speed, which means that if you do just burst over space trying to punch him, then there's a significant chance that you know, as he tries to back away, that you will clip him because he's just going to be moving away bolt upright. Yep. Um, and that certainly kind of happened. And he did trap himself on the fence. But, you know, over time, it was, well, A, Thompson realized that he could just draw the shortest line between two points and simply punch hot Kevin in the face. Uh, Kevin broke his hand. and Thompson broke uh, his too, by the way. Yes. And um, I don't know how late it was i think kevin's was like round one or something yeah i think it literally was, um, may have been the punch that he hurt thompson with because he literally clunked him right on the forehead yeah and uh kevin's uh kevin just can't main kevin can't maintain like a a regular pace that well no. let alone whatever he was doing in that fight so yeah i mean it was it was it was self-destructive um but um but yeah and but just like it was annoying to see some of the more hyperbolic takes about Thompson after the fight. You know, is he the best striker the UFC has ever seen? But he is he is a great striker. And it was just it was great to see him like win a fight. You know, he just got to show again that he is a gritty dude. He is, man. He is a you know, for all the like you know, uh, and, and this kind of ties back to the, the the kickboxing record thing where people are like, Well, it's just completely fake stuff. It's you know, these fights are just um, you know, um, point fighting showcases, they might be. I don't really care. <laughs> but, you know, that Stephen Thompson is is a gritty, tough motherfucker. Yeah, you almost want to think because he's got this, like, flowy, you know, like, agile style that, like, in your in your brain, you think in, like, fighting game terms. And you're like, oh, mm-hmm. that's not the guy who soaks up the most damage. But mm-hmm. uh, you can go all the way back to Stephen Thompson's first real test against Matt Brown and mm-hmm. see that he is a tough motherfucker. He's durable Wait. physically, and he is absolutely down to fight, which is why, despite the staring matches peppered throughout his UFC career, uh, anytime somebody has brought a fight to Stephen Thompson, it has been fireworks. Even the ones where he's largely dominated those fights, um, like the Luke fight largely dominated it but it was fireworks because steven thompson's a counterpuncher. you bring the action to him his impulse is to find a way to punish you for going after him and so it yeah it leads to fun matchups and uh, i just want to say that uh, just don't if they match steven thompson up against a single grappler they have committed gross promotional malpractice wow. clearly just don't do it no because even though he is primarily, well, not primarily, but even though he's a fantastic grappler, we're not going to talk about it at length. But I do think, although Phil mentioned earlier, I think probably RDA fights, good time to make it. No, RDA is going to beat yeah, him now. Time. He's going to beat him 100% because he's going to out-wrestle him. Stephen Thompson clearly can't do it anymore. He can't wrestle people. No, I want Stephen Thompson, if Stephen Thompson wants to not get grapplers, he needs to be honest. 
because uh, someone said this on Twitter, and I agree 100%. Uh, he came out after the fight, and he was like, give me cool, fun strikers. And I'm like, yes, fine. Yes. Sure, you want fun strikers? Go. He's like, also, I want that title. It's like, that, no. That's not going to happen. No. You can't have no, both. No, you can't have the title. You can't mention the title. If you mention the title, you get grapplers. You, you have yes. to never mention the title again. Because the, if you never mention the title again, you can have strikers. Because I made the same like, point, and someone was like, yeah, let's uh, move them up the rankings against all the strikers. Oh, wait. Yeah, it's welterweight. You you're not, you literally cannot progress beyond the point Stephen Thompson is currently at and not fight grapplers. That would be cheating. Yeah, so he fights shit strikers. He is literally beaten three of the, but well, two of probably the hardest punches that have ever been at one seventy, and a really fucking hard one in in, in Luke. You know what I mean? Like he, he, he's never shied away. Like you say, I think that the contention is usually when people say he's a great kickboxer rather than just, oh, he was a fake fighter. If he hasn't proved himself in the last 10 years, yeah. including against fucking Violence King Matt Brown, I don't really know what he can do. OK, fair enough. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's probably still too advanced to even fight someone like Bobby Lawler at this stage, who is well past his best. But, you know, what I mean? give him fun fights against other veterans they're 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 both like 40 but robbie lawler is a is a a different 40 do you know what i mean they're they're, they're vastly different 40 but you know that's the kind of thing he wants is absolutely fine if he wants to go to 185 and just fight someone who's fun do you know what i mean like that's absolutely fine as well but yeah like you don't get out of it both ways but i'm not his biggest fan but fuck me you've got to respect the guy he's been in the ufc for 10 years and he's had he's had a, a couple of stinkers in that time that's absolutely true a couple, but almost you know, everyone of, has. Well, but also in one of them famous stinkers is against one of the stinkiest fighters of all time. So you know, like <laughs> yeah, uh, and you know, and even when like people might criticise him for getting like banged out by Anthony Pettis, at least he was one half of a really fucking amazing moment. Do you know what I mean? Like I like Wonder Boy. I like Wonder Boy. He was nothing as a kickboxer, but as a mixed martial artist, oh, chef's kiss. Yeah, you. I say yeah. You you give him you give him guys like. Um, like Tim Means. One seventy is Finn. Who are you going to Tim Means, Santi, uh, Sa- Tim Means, Ponzinibbio. Ponzinibbio. Yeah. These kind of guys. Yeah. You, maybe ne- maybe Nico Price. Nico Price, absolutely. Like if you want to use his name value to actually progress people who may still have some potential, you give him like Daniel Rodriguez. You give him like um, Jack Dell and Madalena. No, God, no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, why not? I mean, you know. Yeah, sure. Ian Gary, okay. go for it. Ian Gary, for Ian, sure. Ian Gary would be a very fun fight with Stephen Thompson. Jack mm-hmm. Della Medellina, actually, no, you're right. That's actually, that's a perfect fight. Go for it. Yeah. You mm-hmm. need to give the, the young, yeah. young prospect some name cachet. He wants to stand in bang. Let's see him try and take the yeah. body of a, yeah. not exactly elusive, but tricky fighter. That's the kind of matchup mm-hmm. you, want to, you want to do. Yeah. Yep. That it's I'm even fine with leveraging him to build other people's names. It's just like, Shut what are you up. doing? Making no, because he's gonna wrestle him. <laughs> no wrestlers. He, he might do something weird and spitty, like he like, like he's also Shavkat's beyond him now. Like he's just yeah. in a higher tier of contention. Yeah, no wrestlers. I'm just trying to give that guy names. No wrestlers. No forward momentum. Stephen Thompson gets fun fights from here on out, and if that means giving young guns, young strikers, a chance to beat him and build their names, that's fine. At least those would be fights where you can be sure Stephen Thompson's going to compete and be an interesting test. Mm-hmm. Agreed. So, yeah, I actually think Della Madalena is a really interesting fight. Like its name yeah. value. It's uh, Stephen Thompson is. If that is your style, he's still not an easy guy to just go out there and run over. You're going to run into some nasty counters. You're going to have trouble cornering him for sure. So, yeah, fun night. Um, Steven Thompson, cool fighter, always has been. It is what it is. An RDA one, which is always good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll do it for this week's uh, episode of Heavy Hands. I want to thank our esteemed guest, Kyle, for coming back so soon after his last appearance. One that uh, you were talking about then for esteemed guest must be someone, someone else on the show that I haven't spoken to for the duration. But no, thank you, Connor. Sorry, I meant steaming our steaming guest, <laughs> Kyle, <laughs> for coming back so soon. You should check him out on Twitter at Combat CR. Uh, you should check Perfect. out his podcast, Combat Chronicles. He just dropped a Patreon episode today um, about a little uh, MMA uh, fantasy matchmaking. 
And you should find Phil and I on Twitter as well at Boxing Bush. That's me at Evil Greg Jackson. That's Phil. Make sure you check out our Patreon. I don't know if we are actually going to get any uh, bonus stuff out of uh, this week's recording session, but uh, whether or not we do, there will be stuff coming. Kyle, if you're still in, let's do that uh, trio of commentaries for uh, Chocolatito Absolutely. Estrada. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll tell you what, Connor. I'll do that, and then maybe you boys, we, we do something for my patron, yeah? Just something ad hoc, something sure. fun, something short. Um, we'll do a little bit for each yeah. other. How does that sound, boys? I'm in. I'm in. Sounds good. All right. Just, well, just make something up on the spot. It'll be fine. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for listening. Uh, we will see you next week when hopefully something interesting has come out of uh, Uncle Lyev's fight with Blachowicz. And until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. Cheers, boys. Oh, oh shit, quick, Carl, 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 quick. Break down yeah. Paddy Pembler, Jared Gordon. Shit. Oh, do it, do it. Hope the scouts can't get his fucking mullet punched off. <laughs> <laughs>